Today I'm going to make the following proposition. First, we must shape a different kind of economy, a next economy that is driven by exports, powered by low carbon, fueled by innovation, and rich with opportunity. This is a vision where we export more, we waste less, we innovate in what matters, we produce and deploy more of what we invent, and we ensure that the economy actually works for working families. Second, the next economy will be largely metropolitan in form and in function. Our major metro areas in this country generate nearly three quarters of our gross domestic product. We may be nostalgic about small town America, but it is metropolitan America that drives our national economy and determines our national prosperity. This is true abroad, as I mentioned before. It is absolutely true here in the United States. This is the real heart of the American economy. A hundred metropolitan areas that after decades of growth constitute only 12% of our land mass, but house two-thirds of our population and generate three quarters of our gross domestic product. These metros form a new economic geography, seamlessly enveloping cities and suburbs, exurbs and rural towns, and they pack a powerful punch. Chicagoland is home to 67% of the population of the state, but you contribute 78% of your state's GDP. Greater Seattle, 51% of the state of Washington, but 69% of the economic output of that state. And metro areas generate the majority of GDP in 47 of the 50 states, including such rural states as Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, and Arkansas. Bottom line, there is no national American economy. Rather, the U.S. economy is a network of powerful metropolitan economies, and metropolitan economies are powerful precisely because they bring together networks of large firms, small entrepreneurs, skilled labor, advanced research, colleges and schools, business associations, and yes, government. Top 100 metros together dominate our trade in goods and services. And given their edge in sectors like chemicals, computers, and consulting, they're on the front lines of commerce with Brazil, India, and China. The nation's four largest exporting metros, New York, LA, Chicago, Houston, supersized performers exporting more than $50 billion a piece in 2008. Other major metros, Dallas, San Francisco, Boston, Philly, Detroit, Seattle, they're also global players, exporting more than $24 billion a piece in 2008. Incredibly, these 10 large metros generated close to 30% of national exports in 2008. It's not just about the large metros. As we see here, these 10 medium-sized metros are dependent on exports in ways that larger metros are not. Exports contribute more than 15% of gross metropolitan product in these economies. Top 100 metros dominate exports for another good reason. There are logistical hubs. They concentrate the movement of people and goods by air, rail, and sea. If we're going to build this next economy, the United States must unleash the entrepreneurial energies and dynamism of our metropolitan engines. We compete in a fiercely competitive world. Established nations like Germany, rising nations like China, India, and Brazil are making transformative investments in modern ports, in renewable energy, in high-speed rail, in advanced research institutions, in the precise places, Munich and Shanghai and Mumbai and Sao Paulo, that drive their national economies. We must do the same. So let me begin by offering a vision for the next American economy. And let's begin with exports and our need to fully engage the world. Visualize an economy where more firms in more sectors trade more goods and services seamlessly with the world, particularly with nations that are rapidly urbanizing and industrializing. Why exports? Because we have crossed an economic Rubicon. Together, Brazil, India, and China, the BICs, are expected to account for about a fifth of global GDP in 2010, surpassing the United States for the first time. By 2015, the big share will grow to more than 
The rise of the BICs reflects the rise of metros. For the first time in recorded history, more than half of the world's population lives in cities and metropolitan areas. And by 2030, the metro share will grow to 60%. Rising nations and their rapidly growing metros now power the world economy and drive global demand. The locus of economic power in the world is shifting. The top 30 metro performers in the last year are almost exclusively located in Asia and Latin America. The 30 worst metro performers are nearly all located in Europe and the United States. The U.S. needs to reorient our economy to take advantage of this global demand. In 2008, exports made up only 13% of the GDP of the United States, compared to 36% in China, 35% in Canada, and much higher levels in India, Japan, and the entire EU. The movement of freight in the United States is compromised, undermined by transport networks that are clogged and congested, and an infrastructure that everyone in this room knows is third class. And culturally, Americans don't get out much. Only about 28% of our citizens have a passport. So can we get back into the export game? We think the answer is decidedly yes. We still manufacture a range of advanced goods that the rest of the world wants. Spacecraft, aircraft, electrical machinery, high precision surgical instruments, high quality pharmaceutical products. We already have a trade surplus in services, $152 billion in 2008, and we're poised for a quantum leap in the export of high value services. America's potential for exports is hidden in plain sight, and President Obama's challenge to double exports in five years is exactly the kind of ambitious, far-reaching challenge we need at this moment. Now, low carbon is the second hallmark of the next U.S. economy. So let's imagine a world where America is the vanguard of the clean green revolution, or as Dr. Ackerman has suggested, the second industrial revolution. Everything is about to change. The energy we use will migrate from an almost exclusive focus on carbon-based fuels to a more sustainable mix. The infrastructure we build will shift from outmoded transport and energy to systems that are smarter and faster and technologically enabled. The products we buy will move from high carbon gas guzzlers to an eclectic basket of green, sustainable goods. And the homes we live in and the office and retail buildings we frequent will be more sustainable in design, more efficient in their use of water and energy, and better arrayed so we can walk more, spend less, and live a higher quality of life. Our competitors, China, Germany, Brazil, have embraced the green economy. They are creating markets, they are growing jobs, they are stimulating investment. China is hell-bent on being the world's green producer, and they are out-investing us on renewable energy and high-speed rail and a host of other sustainable interventions. Can the U.S. even play in the low-carbon revolution? Our research shows that we already have a strong base of more than two million green jobs in sectors ranging from renewable energy to pollution reduction. No other nation can match us in domestic demand, advanced research, venture capital, and entrepreneurial dynamism. It is time for us to fully engage the shift to low carbon and leapfrog other nations on a market transformation as profound as the information revolution. That leads naturally to a discussion of innovation. The U.S. must be the world's innovation nation, a hothouse not just of ideas and invention, but a platform for advanced production. I believe we're on the cusp of an historic era of technological progress, of technological acceleration, which will dramatically change how people live, companies operate, and communities function. I think this could be our future.
okay, maybe we won't have that much innovation, at least this century. But self-driving vehicles, smart homes, remote monitoring of health, the future is coming soon and in some cases is already here. These technologies are not just cool stuff. They will change lives, they will save lives, they will drive investment, they will create jobs, and they will transform economies. Can the U.S. seize the future and be the world's innovation nation? We now place just 45th out of 93 countries in the share that science and engineering degrees make up of bachelor's degrees. Going forward, we will innovate less if we do not embrace fully science and technology. The U.S. lags on the conversion of innovation into homegrown production. We have gone from running a trade surplus in advanced technology products to running a trade deficit over the past decade. Going forward, we will innovate less if we do not produce more. We must make things again in the United States. It is time to rediscover our innovation mojo in our vocational and tech schools, on our factory floors, in, in the tradable goods and service sectors that drive wealth creation and sustainable growth. Now finally, the next economy does have the potential to be opportunity rich. Research shows that firms in export intense industries pay workers higher wages and are more likely to provide health and retirement benefits. A low carbon economy, as Dr. Ackerman has suggested, could be an engine for job creation, delivered by millions of new workers across a range of professions and occupations. And innovation has always been the historic catalyst and fuel for economic growth. All of this is going to require the United States to get real smart, real fast. Over the next several decades, African Americans and Hispanics will grow from about 25% to nearly 40% of our working age populations. Yet the rates of educational attainment are lowest among these fast-growing groups. In 2008, only 13% of Hispanics, only 18% of African Americans had a bachelor's degree. And that contrasts sharply with the educational attainment figures for whites and Asians. In the decades ahead, upgrading the education and skills of our diverse workforce is no longer just a matter of social equity. It is fundamentally an issue of national competitiveness and national security. I challenge you, in short, to act like a pragmatic caucus across sectors, disciplines, jurisdictions, and yes, even political parties. If you do these things, guaranteed, jobs will follow, investment will flow, innovation will spread like wildfire across this country. You are the distinctive, grounded voice in the debate that's coming over jobs and taxes and the economy and investment. Let that voice be heard in action and innovation, but also advocacy. We are a metro nation in a metro world, and it is high time we started acting like one. Thank you very much.